the female wolf came crying to the man, who realized it was in trouble. Wild animals behave differently when they receive friendly help, they know who has helped them and may even return the favor to those who help them. In addition to these few examples, animals can sense many surprising things. Animals can tell if you are angry, sad or drunk, or if you are sick or have cancer. They can sense your thoughts, emotions and actions by the tone of your voice, they can sense the slightest movement and know your next move, and they can sense if there is danger. Now that I think about it, I saw that your question said animal above, so for some reason I interpreted the dog's behavior, and I bet the answer applies to all animals, so I'll post it anyway. One spring morning, many years ago, I had been prospecting for gold along Coho Creek on Kapunov Island in southeast Alaska. As I emerged from a forest of spruce and hemlock, I stopped in my tracks. I found a huge Alaskan timber wolf in a swamp not more than 20 paces away, trapped in Trap George's trap. Old George had left a few weeks earlier after suffering a heart attack. So this wolf was lucky that I happened to come across it. It was confused and scared by my approach, then the wolf broke free of the trap chain, and then I noticed something else. It was a female and it still had milk in its teeth. So there must be a litter of hungry pups somewhere waiting for their mother. From its condition, I guessed it had only been trapped for a few days, which meant its pups were probably still alive and must be only a few miles away. But I was afraid that if I let the wolf go, it would attack me and rip my clothes to shreds. This was a survival skill that applied in any emergency situation. So I decided to look for its pups and look for signs that it had come here. Fortunately, there were still tracks to be found on the snow on the ground. After a while, I found paw prints on a trail at the edge of a swamp. The paw print went through a half mile of forest, then it climbed up a rocky slope. I finally found the den at the base of a giant spruce, and there was no sound at all inside. The wolf cubs were shy and cautious, and I didn't hold out much hope. I would succeed in luring them outside, but I had to try once, so I began to imitate the high-pitched screams the mother wolf made when it called its cubs, but there was no response. I tried again a few minutes later and that's when the sound of a wolf cub appeared. They couldn't have been more than a few weeks old. I held out my hands to pick them up while they tentatively sucked on my fingers. Perhaps hunger had overcome their fear, and then I placed them in a burlap sack one by one and headed down the slope. When the female wolf saw me, it stood up straight. It probably smelled the cubs and it barked loudly, then I let the wolf cubs out. In a few seconds they lifted it up and cooed at its belly. The next thing that struck me as odd was that the mother wolf was in pain. But every time I walked in its direction a terrible growling sound would come out of its throat. It became belligerent as it tried to protect its cubs. It needed nourishment, and I thought I would have to find it something it needed. I walked toward Coho Creek and spotted a deer in a snowbank. I carried the venison back to the wolf and whispered in a soothing tone, Mother Wolf, your dinner is on the table. Don't you growl at me and take it easy. I threw a large piece of venison at it, and it sniffed it, then wolfed it down. I cut off half of a hemlock tree, built a rudimentary shelter for myself, and then soon fell asleep nearby. At dawn, I was awakened by four bundles of furry furs. They sniffed my face and hands. I glanced at the anxious mother wolf. All I could do was to win its trust, which I thought was its only hope. Over the next few days, I spent my time exploring and trying to earn the wolf's trust. I talked to it gently, threw it more venison and played with the wolf cubs. I got a little closer, though I was careful to stay out of the chain's length. The big animal never took its dark eyes off of me. Come on, mother wolf. Go back to your friends on the mountain and relax. At dusk on the fifth day, I brought it the daily venison. Here's dinner. 
I whispered as I approached, come on, there's nothing to be afraid of. Suddenly the cubs lunged at me, at least I had gained trust. But I no longer hoped to win their mother's trust. Then I thought I saw its tail wag slightly as I walked within the length of its chain, it didn't move, and I didn't say a word. I sat eight feet from it and its huge paws could have hit my arm or neck with a single tap. I wrapped the blanket around me and slowly laid down on the cold ground. It took me a long time to fall asleep, and I woke up at dawn to the sound of the wolf cubs nursing. I gently leaned down to pet them, but the mother wolf became stiff. Good morning, friends. I said tentatively. Then I slowly placed my hand on the wolf's injured leg. It flinched, but it didn't make a threatening move, which I suppose couldn't happen, but it did. I could see that the steel trap had caught two of its toes, which were becoming swollen. But if I wasn't scared, it wouldn't have lost its paws. All right. I said, just wait a little longer and I'll get you out. I had the pressure to open the trap and the wolf pulled the three wolf cubs out. Based on my experience in the wild, this wolf would have picked up its pups and disappeared into the woods by now, but it didn't. It crawled cautiously toward me. The cubs nibbled mischievously at their mother before my elbow. It slowly sniffed my hand and arm, then licked my finger, which was unlike anything I've ever heard about forest wolves. But strangely enough, it all seemed natural. After a while, the mother wolf's cubs were scurrying around it. As the mother wolf prepared to leave, it limped toward the forest and then looked back at me. Do you want me to come with you? I asked curiously. But I had also packed my bags and set off. After walking along the Coho River for a few miles, we ascended Cooper Mountain and reached an alpine meadow. Wolves lurked in the forest, and I counted nine adult wolves in all. Judging by their mischievous antics, there were four new adult pups. A few minutes later, the pack suddenly howled. It was an eerie sound, ranging from a low wail to a high-pitched minstrel. I pitched my tent after dark, and by the light of the glittering moon I could see the ghostly wolf shadows flickering out in the shadows by the light of the fire. Their eyes glittered and I was not afraid. They were probably just curious, and I was just as curious. I looked back and it was time to entrust the wolf to its pack. The wolves started to cross the grass to the far side. I looked back and the mother wolf and its pups were sitting where I had left them watching me. I didn't know why they did this, but I waved my hands at the same time and the mother wolf let out a long wail. For years later, after serving in World War II, I returned to Coho Creek. It was the fall of 1945, and after the horrors of war, I was back in the towering spruce in the familiar fresh air of the Alaskan bush. I felt good. And then I saw the rusted steel trap I had hung on the red seat for years earlier that had not trapped Mother Wolf. After seeing it, a strange feeling came over me. This feeling led me to climb up Cooper Mountain to the meadow where I last saw it. Standing high up, I let out a long, low whistle, which I had done many times before. Suddenly, an echo came again from a distance. I called out and the echo echoed again. This time, about half a mile away in the ridge, the sound of a wolf's cry came. Then a long way off, I saw a black figure moving slowly in my direction. As it crossed the grass, I could see that it was a wolf. A chill invaded my whole body, and even after four years, I immediately knew that familiar figure. I greeted it gently anyway, and the wolf slowly approached, it put its ears up, its body tensed, and stopped a few miles away. Its thick tail wagged slightly, and after a while the wolf walked away. Shortly after that, I left Cooper in the island and have not seen the animal since. But it left me with these vivid memories. It was a little spooky, but I will never forget it. It reminds us that there is something in nature beyond human understanding. In that brief moment, 
this wounded animal and I somehow penetrated each other's worlds, bridging barriers that should never have been crossed. No experience can explain these, we can only accept them. They emanate an air of mystery and strangeness, which may make us cherish them even more. To an animal, a good person is someone who does not pose an immediate danger, especially someone who provides food, not someone who donates to charity, and not someone who never drives over the speed limit. Just observe a cat in action and you will see that it will not hesitate to walk towards its familiar owner, purring and rubbing its owner's ankles. It will flee from strangers, it will immediately and instinctively know who the bad guy is, and it will accept a stranger's gentle offer with extreme caution. But after a period of time and repeated encounters, they will eventually see the person as a good person rather than a bad person. Based on their own judgment, they will always seem to remember that this is part of most memories, including ours. Although we do not recommend scent recognition as proof of trustworthiness, they may be fearful of some people, such as the first time they see them, and they will literally run and hide. At the same time for them, they will show a friendly attitude towards strangers they meet for the first time, which they do voluntarily, without the intervention of their owners. Over the next few days, the man camped near the pups of the wolves. He spent a lot of time looking for wolf food, and he even established a bond with the pups. One day, as he was preparing dinner for the mother wolf, it suddenly began to wag its tail gently. They know that good or bad comes from humans, and dogs and cats don't care about this at all. They don't even understand the concept. The wolves eat their food quickly because they have no such concept and no need to wait. Cats do the same with mice and snakes. However, both dogs and cats know that morality, good and evil incarnate, comes from humans. When mothers fail to bring food to their children, it is because they have done something bad, not some good. Dogs can also be sensitive to both praise and punishment. Thanks for watching, please like and share the video in your social networks and we will get back to you as soon as possible. Thank you.